Senator Bernie Sanders vows not to go after his colleague Elizabeth Warren. Meanwhile, the rest of the Senate is afraid of who could replace Susan Collins. Our friend Ryan brings some exclusive new reporting. And of course, we're going to talk about some polls here. Team Ryzen is here. Roger Fisk is a Democratic strategist and an alum of the Obama administration. He also served as senior aide of communication and policy to Senator John Kerry. Right. Henry Rogers is a Capitol Hill reporter at The Daily Caller. Well, we you know have our familiar faces here I'm very happy about. We've got a YouGov poll out, guys, which is interesting. It shows Biden at 26 percent, Elizabeth Warren at 20 percent, Senator Bernie Sanders at 14 percent. The margin on this one is 2.6. But generally what we're seeing, I think, Roger, is Joe Biden continues. He may have the consolidation up at the top, but every time I look at one of these polls, he's either tied or he's slipping down. Being in the low to mid-20s is not a trend that he wants to be in, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And first off, thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, I've said this all along. The last thing you want to be at this point in the race, I'll, I'll change my tune after mm -hmm. Labor Day, but the last thing you want to be right now is, is the front runner and also the front runner with a large lead yeah. because there's only one direction to go from there. And I think what you're seeing in his world, it's very interesting to look at kind of the tonality of these campaigns as kind of cultures. And what, you, what I get from his campaign is the, the significant difference between playing not to lose as opposed to playing to win. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is bearing out. That said, uh, you know, if we get 10 and 20 days after Labor Day and this, starts, this stuff starts to hold, you know, this is when the concrete starts to harden in, in a lot of ways, especially if we get past Halloween and this, these numbers are still holding. So there's reason for uh, encouraging news in those polls, but then they still need to be wary of, yeah. you know, what the next couple steps are. Well, I think the other story within this is that Kamala Harris is in single digits. I haven't seen a poll putting her in double digits for a long time, and she really has just begun to slip. Her upper middle class class white liberal base is all just going straight to Elizabeth Warren, right, Henry? I mean, she, yeah, Kamala Harris is just not doing she, very well. No, it looks like she's completely tanking. In every yeah. poll that I've looked at in the right. last couple of weeks, um, she's really gone down. Uh, and, and Biden, like you were just saying, he's mm -hmm. gone down too. But Elizabeth Warren, she's coming up she's coming slowly up. but surely. She's coming up. Um, and this is something I personally did not expect. But here, yeah. here you have. She has a large following, it appears. I mean, we were see, mm -hmm. just seeing videos of her, of her campaigns, yeah. crowds of, of thousands and thousands of people. Um, so this is a very interesting, I think, to yeah. see uh, at, this, at this time going on. Yeah, the establishment wing has got a problem here. It, it, it would almost be better for them if Joe Biden would read the room and just be like, you know what? Third time wasn't a charm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out. And give the establishment opportunity to try to figure out: Is it? Are we going to put all our chips on Kamala? Are we going to put them all on Mayor Pete? Right. Is it Booker, who who we think can mm -hmm. surge past? But at least give them an opportunity to challenge the the left wing yeah. of the party. But if he stays in all the way through Iowa, and he comes into Iowa, even if he's a couple points ahead going into Iowa, he's got no ground game there. Yeah. Now he's got old people who are probably going to come out, yeah. so that helps yeah. him. Yeah, absolutely. But Elizabeth Warren has the best operatives in Iowa, and Bernie Sanders has the best organizers. And so they are going to probably slightly outperform whatever they're polling yeah. at. And Biden's probably going to slightly underperform. So if he's not 10, 15 points up going into Iowa, then he loses that. He loses New Hampshire. And, he faces, and then the establishment has no opportunity to kind of uh, get behind a, a, a new horse. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, Biden's going to keep tanking, in my opinion, because of the things that he's saying on the road. He keeps beating himself up, keeps slipping up, having these these and mishaps. He's got no schedule. He's got no and, and he's got yeah. and yeah, very limited uh, access to press mm -hmm. um, and and things like this. So. So I think Biden's numbers are going to continue to go down. So it will be very interesting to see what happens as the months go on here. Um, what do you think, Roger, about uh, Ryan's point, which I thought was really interesting, which is about letting the establishment kind of fight it out and choose who the standard bearer is rather than kind of this anointed prince who is really not doing so well? Uh, yeah. You know, being a, a product of the Obama kind of organization, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of letting the establishment yeah. decide things because I frankly don't think they're very good at it. Mm. Um, the interesting thing with the former vice president is his kind of strengths, I think, are slowly kind of looking at the calendar in an inverted way. 
Um, I think he's relatively weak in Iowa. He's wide, but he's shallow. Yeah. Um, he's a little stronger in New Hampshire because New Hampshire tends to reward decades-long relationships more than Iowa does. And then he's actually starting to look stronger in South Carolina. So I think I think you're actually starting to see them look at like if we can get through second or third in the first two states, and then South Carolina is his thing, and I then it goes right. national. I've, I've but, been looking. At, so that's like just he, me. Like it's like at a the pyramid teams. where he's not going to do very well there, but he's going to just sweep the South and South Carolina and all that post Super Tuesday. But we should also talk about Ryan has got some interesting new reporting about Senate Democrats and Chuck Schumer pressuring a progressive right. candidate. Tell us a little bit about that. Ryan, and then let's discuss. So we know that the DCCC uh, has an official blacklist policy now. So if, if you work for, if you're a consultant and you work for a challenger to in a Democratic incumbent, you can't get any business from the, the Democratic Party. That's kind of been an, an informal understanding yeah. for uh, a generation. Uh, but they finally formalized it this year. They put it, they put it out on, on paper. Uh, what we're reporting at The Intercept today is that the DSCC, through uh, Chuck Schumer, has been pressuring consultants not to work with uh, challengers to uh, Hickenlooper in Colorado. And what's interesting about this is that the, this pressure came when Hickenlooper was running for president and was saying that he wouldn't make a good senator yeah. and doesn't even want to be a senator. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're so insistent that Andrew Romanoff, yeah. the former House Speaker, uh, not win the Democratic primary. He challenged Michael Bennett uh, in 2010 and, and nearly nearly beat him. Uh, that they have pressured, uh, according to Romanoff, uh, at least five consultants yeah. um, not to work with. If you work with Romanoff, don't come to the party for any business. Roger, you've been around for a long time. I mean, I'm, I'm sure this stuff has Thanks, been happening. Soccer. But <laughs> when, whenever we look at these types of tactics, it really does seem like the D, the D triple DSCC, the DNC, all these organizations, they are not doing the establishment any favor because it leaks through and it, it becomes obvious that they are trying to quash and direct the, the, the nature of these races that they're not very good at winning. Didn't I yeah. just make that point? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. You know, the, this, yeah. I, frankly for me, this yeah. I don't know, there's a lot of stuff we could be chatting about. This doesn't really right. scratch a, a major itch for me. Uh -huh. um, although, I mean, that said, it's not unusual that a Boehner or a Pelosi or a Schumer or a McConnell would be looking at their map mm -hmm. and trying to guide things towards success, right? Like, I don't see how that's necessarily some right. kind of yeah. epiphany. If they were good at it. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, if, if the, you looked back and you're like, you know what? Yeah, you, you, you pushed a lot of centrists through the nomination process, but you won the majority, and you used those majorities uh, to pass popular policies, and that and you're you're setting yourself up for a, well, a stable majority. Then okay, yeah. then, then we can then we can talk about interfering mm. in primaries. Yeah, I just I think it's so interesting that you're that just reporting. I mean, that, that Schumer was pushing Hickenlooper to 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 stay on here because. Okay. Do you do you know how many clips there were of him just saying he was an awful senator? Yeah, I right. mean, he should not be. You know, there's no way he should be. A senator. <laughs> I, it's like, I, it's, I feel bad for the guy now yeah. because now he's going to be put in this position where they want him to run for senate. Right. And here he is. He's beaten himself up like a thousand times already. There's like a, there's like a whole compilation punching bag video of somewhere out there of him out there just beating himself up, saying he would make an awful senator. Yeah. So here we go. Um, we'll see what happens there. Democrats again eating their own. It's mm -hmm. not the best slogan. Yeah, it's not the best slogan. It might be a bad sign. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what the real thing is here is, is about is about the national party infrastructure and how it selects and orients candidates. And overall, it's not. It just seems to be continually out of step. It's something that the Republican Party had the same thing. How do you think it actually will get changed, Roger? Or or will it ever change? Will they ever allow the actual people within the party in order to select their nominee without trying to move things around on the margins? I, I wish I yeah. could help you. I mean, the yeah. DNC is relatively opaque to me. I've done yeah. three presidential campaigns, and the less you interact with the DNC, the better in my <laughs> world. Honestly, yeah. I mean, all the way down to the state committees. For example, in our first campaign, it was very clear to us that the New Hampshire Democratic Party was already, you know, behind a particular candidate. And so we actually used to have fun with it and feed them, like, wrong dates and wrong <laughs> venues and yeah. things like that so you could just see them in the Concord Monitor the next day. Huh. So I don't think I'm your guy to provide <laughs> yeah. a lot of visibility on this stuff. <laughs> but you are one to beat up on them, which is what we always appreciate. So you guys you guys sit tight. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come right back. After this.